Welcome back to The Great Ship, The Space Show Show, where we are not talking about the abuse of child stars. <laughs> not uh, even though one person on Next Gen was actually abused, but I, not, the, by, not, not by anybody on the show. And not a child? Well, yeah, okay. at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Different, different abuses <laughs> happening all over the town. Uh, I'm your host, Lieutenant Commander Rebecca Frost, joined as always, as per usual, Admiral Carrie Jackson, Commander Robert Neal, and Lee Cooties of Borg. Lee, explain yep. your name. <laughs> Well, uh, we will give you the cooties. You cannot resist us. <laughs> you'll, you'll get the little cooties of Borg. We'll make our cooties part of your distinctness. Well, so. we have a very exciting episode for you guys today because we are wrapping up season three of Star Trek The Next Whoa. Generation. Uh, and we will be talking about these episodes, The Most Toys, Sarek, Menage a Troy, Transfigurations, and The Best of Both Worlds Part 1. Uh, and I just want to say I have not watched Best of Both Worlds Part 2 yet because I've been waiting <laughs> to record this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be fine, but we'll get we'll get to it. No, we'll, a little we're bit. just going to spoil it right off the bat. Picard never comes back. He's a boy Oh, forever. no. Yep. Oh, oh, season uh, 4. Whole uh, season four. He, Riker's captain from this point forward. I mean, oh, it's okay. Well, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, this, this episode first called The Most Toys. When transporting a dangerous material to the Enterprise, Data is kidnapped and the crew is led to believe he is dead when the shuttlecraft he was piloting explodes en route. Um, a typical, mena a classic menage we have here. So... Uh, the Enterprise is in the process of procuring hydridium, which is used to decontaminate the water supply at a Federation colony. Um, the water supply was contaminated very suddenly without any gradual buildup. Take note of that for the future. Uh, hydridium is too unstable for transporters, and hence Data was shuttling the material between the trader ship and the Enterprise. But before Data leaves with the last shipment, um, Kivas who he's been working with, uh, deactivates Data with an energy surge and sends an empty shuttle towards the Enterprise, which explodes mid-transport. Um, and for a, an android with only one shutoff button, he sure shuts down easily with any kind of like electric <laughs> surge. Well, the button's this big. <laughs> but it seems like all you also have to do is like shuffle your feet on the carpet for a minute and then touch him and he'll... Static discharge is a big deal. They don't have Android. surge protectors in the 24th century. No, they didn't think oh, they needed no. them anymore. <laughs> Ash and surge protectors. Those two things no one has in Starfleet. So Kivas shares his ship's sensor information of the explosion with the Enterprise. And the Enterprise leaves as there is nothing else to do. They have um, the hydridium, which is barely enough to complete their mission to decontaminate that water. But now everybody also has to deal with the loss the uh, the assumed loss of their friend data um but if you remember uh that one star wars movie where remember chewbacca was on that one ship and, <coughs> and then that ship exploded and then chewbacca shows up and like everything's fine uh that's what that's what's happened here <laughs> that's exactly what happened here. i seem, to, exactly have blocked, I seem happened. to have blocked Perfect. everything you were talking about mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah. Rebecca. <laughs> so, Data, who is presumed killed in the accident, actually finds himself uh, now kept captive on a starship um, by Kivas Fajo and his assistant Varia, who have an impressive collection of contraband treasures, including a 1962 Roger Mardis tra baseball trading card. Uh, Kivas says that he has kidnapped da Data for his own amusement. So we, like I said, this is a classic menage, except uh, a little bit more hostile, I think. Um, Data, of course, refuses to be valued. Uh, to be, he refuses to be a valued capture and attempts escape. He can't attack Kivas as has, he is covered with a protective force field, and all of the doors on the ship are DNA encoded. Kivas assigns a chair for Data to sit in his room of exotic treasures. <laughs> I love how he kept saying, would you please sit in the chair? Please, would you sit just sit in, in the chair? Would you just, look, the oh, chair, sit right? The, would you, you know. the, the problem was they had to go with budget Paul Reiser. If they'd gone with real Paul Reiser, Data would have gotten in the chair. There's well, a story. Yeah. 
well, I'll tell I'll, well, I'll talk a little bit more about him okay. later on. About budget Paul Reiser? Oh, yes. Awesome. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't know there was a story. <laughs> there is. There, so there is a story. Okay. So Varya, the assistant, tells Data that Kivas is lavish when obeyed and equally brutal when not. Data <sighs> makes Varya realize that she is a slave, just like him. She says that the Enterprise is not looking for Data since Kivas added traces of Data's component elements to the shuttle, just in the right proportions to fool the sensors into believing that Data was in the shuttle. Um. He, Data is also um, provided with clothes, and they ask him, please wear these clothes, and it's giving big Beauty and the Beast vibes. Uh, <laughs> Data does not want to change his clothes. So, Davis throws acid on him, um, which will not affect his skin or anything, but really just eats all of his clothing away. Um, just horrific honestly mm -hmm. back on the enterprise Worf yes. has chosen to replace data on the bridge at his station and ooh, I to get a glimpse inside Worf's head at this point because not a, this is the second time that Worf has been promoted after the death of a friend the first time he was promoted after Tasha died and now he's been promoted promoted after data dies and while I guess within Klingon culture like this is kind of how it like this well, usually should, should replace be the guy you murdered yeah usually yeah, you murdered like the, the, yeah. yeah but uh and not to say that his um that tasha and data died without honor right because they died in circumstances beyond their control um but uh mm, can't feel great if you're wharf you know yeah uh yeah if he was if he was human he'd take the uh he'd, he'd just take the promotion and be happy about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> be like gosh i wonder who's gonna die next i'll be captain in no time <laughs> i hope it's the lieutenant oh no uh, he died oh what a shame oh. <laughs> hey, Jordy, Jordy, be my best friend. It's Jordy that... fell down the turbo lift. <laughs> oh no! I'm engineer now. Night where the guy gets sucked into the jet engine and Rachel McAdams like, yes. Oh no, he died. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so meanwhile, Data won't cooperate when Kivas brings his friend Toff around to show him off. Kivas wants Data to behave normally, but Data stands completely still as a mannequin. Um, dance, it's... monkey, dance. <laughs> What's the uh, uh, malicious compliance, or at least like malicious incompetence, weaponized incompetence kind of here, where um, I can't, can't, I'm not going to dance for you. Uh, uh, let's see. Kivas well, I, I thought it was a working model. Oh, it, 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 it doesn't work, then it's not as valuable. It's, uh, you know. Kivas uh, returns later with a disruptor weapon to which... <laughs> My reaction to this um, was a little absurd because I know that disruptors are illegal within the Federation. And the way I gasped and I said, you're not supposed to have that. <laughs> <laughs> what about him makes you think he's a good guy at this point? I I, like I said, I, my reaction um, did not need to be the way that it was. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I still maybe was like, she overreacted a little. <laughs> you can't. You can't. And uh, anyway, so Kivas threatens to use the disruptor on Varia, the assistant, if Data does not comply. Uh, back on board the Enterprise, Jordy and Wesley champion the thesis that uh, it doesn't fit with Data's android nature after careful examination of all of the recordings. And they find that Data did not follow standard procedure in his last flight from the Jovis. He did not report the departure of the shuttle from Jovis like he did in the first two trips. Um, Meanwhile, the Enterprise has also gone to this water, this tainted water supply, and the away team finds that somebody planted the poison in the water supply deliberately. Somebody's poisoned the water hole. <laughs> and... <laughs> Get us Sherlock data. Oh wait. And uh, this this poison in the water supply can only be treated with the hydridium that they had picked up from Kivas. Hmm. Uh, um. And. Uh, he happened to be around with just the right amount of hydridium to solve the problem. Mm. Just an awfully mm. convenient solution to an awfully quick problem. That's Picard a real coincidence. A real coinky dink. Picard realizes that Kivas is a collector of rare and valuable objects and rushes back to intercept the Jovis. They get reports on Jovis's last reported positions and head there. Meanwhile, Varya has decided to help Data escape, uh, and she wants Data to take her with him. I love a classic, I'll help you escape, but you have to take me with you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she does help Data get to the shuttle bay, um, but they are intercepted, and Kivas uses the disruptor on her, the weapon he's not supposed to have. Uh, 
and uh, <laughs> just killed like a horrific. This has got to be a horrific death. Like just totally like incinerated, and you matter mm-hmm. is sprinkled amongst the stardust. Um, just I can't imagine how painful it is. It's uh, like being microwaved, and, and then you sp- and then you explode. Uh, yeah. So he blames Kivas blames it on Data, um, and. There, there's a bit of a struggle, and Data comes into possession of the Disruptor, and they're having a bit of a standoff where Data, it looks like he's going to shoot Kivas, but Kivas is like, you can't shoot me, you're an android, it's against your programming. And then, and then something magnificent happens. <laughs> Data is beamed back aboard the Enterprise right as he's about to fire. Uh, and so Kivas is arrested, the stolen treasures return to the owners, blah, blah, blah. But then um, Data has this conversation with Riker where um, Riker is like, hey, this showed a discharge. Did you fire this weapon? And Data says no. (laughs) And so the show just got 10 times more interesting to me. The show is already very interesting to me. But the show just got 10 times more interesting to me. If you think of Data as an android who is capable of murder and lies and deceit. And so now suddenly we have this potentially rogue android aboard the ship with the potential to commit to commit murder if he wants just throwing it out there Mm. and even Riker has like visible suspicion on his face too when when data is like well i didn't mm -hmm. this could have been me i mean i i don't think data's in the wrong for thinking it's pretty suspicious of Riker to be questioning him about suspicious discharges (laughs) (laughs) wow (laughs) <laughs> uh, I liked the uh, the CSI element of this, where you know they solved the mystery back on the ship. I thought yes. that was kind of cool. You know, it was very. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens um, when when you're no longer acting ensign. You you start coming up with really good theories. Yeah, mm-hmm. even if your uniform's too small or too big. Uh, this kind of reminded me of um, episodes with. Like Q and going back to like Troyne of uh, Squire of Gothos, just like I want this, I'm gonna have it, and damn the consequences. And that's what uh, Kivas reminded me of here. It's just like, oh God, somebody who's just like, I want this because nobody else has it, mm-hmm. or the, yeah. you know. And as a collector, I'm just like, oh God, that's the the horrible dark, <laughs> dark, dark side of collecting. Just well, like, I, no, I, no, no. I wonder if the writers, if that's who they were singling out, were these collectors. Because you remember, oh. at, the, at that time, we were all in a frenzy, just buying at everything, time. whether we needed it or not, we were just buying everything, you know. I, I, I mean, I was okay with Ghost Rider. Why did I need all the figures, you know? I mean, I, <laughs> we were ransacking at the time, because the, the two toy lines we were after the most were the Star Trek figures from mm-hmm. Playmates, and then Toy Biz's uh, X-Men and yeah. Marvel figures. Yeah. We were going eight shit over a Richter figure. Yeah. And the Richter figure had a wind up, twist up vibration thing on his hip that made him shake. Mm-hmm. And that's what we were like, gotta have Richter. Yeah. Yeah. And and <laughs> the same with the Star Trek figures. I mean, they were they were mostly just eh, okay, you know. <laughs> but we had to have them all. Even even a character that was in only one episode, a character we didn't give a damn about. We had to have them all, you know. As so, I was watching this episode, I was like, bring back Trelane, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> I would So there was something that. else about this episode that um, Kivas' force field, um, I just want to make sure I get this right, uh, proximity actuated force field that imp- impedes positron flows. And I was looking at when this came out, and I'm going to make a comic reference here, because uh, about three years before this, DC rebooted their universe with the first crisis. And they, when they were reintroducing Superman, they had Superman flying to Gotham to basically apprehend Batman and bring him to justice. And Batman's like, you're not going to do that. And Superman's like, why not? And Batman's like, well, you've got all these different visions. Take a look at me in this spectrum. And he does. And there's a force field around him. And he says, if you don't do it, this force field is key to super dense biological matter. You. So if you break this force field, there's a bomb attached to it. It will kill an innocent person. I'm going to go catch a criminal now. Bye. Oh, okay. Turns out 
turns out the innocent person was Batman. But I was I looked at this. I'm just going to like I've heard this before. Where <laughs> <laughs> did you and and when when did that happen in the comics? Was it before this? <sighs> It was before this. So this would have been like 80, oh. 80 I think 86, possibly 87. Ah, So I wonder if this was something that somebody's like, this would be a fun twist. Yeah. I like um, your theory. I like that. Rob, you're so smart. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? No, I just have, I just have a really deep knowledge of useless <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, trivia for this episode. One, um, this episode features a shuttle pod Pike named after Christopher Pike. Thought that was very nice. Uh, in a scene that was never filmed, Kivas sends Varya to test Data's sexual abilities. Uh, blah, blah. Yeah, we could have done without that. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, let's talk about the actor who plays Kivas. Um, so the actor David Rappaport was to have played Kivas, but attempted suicide a few days into filming. Ooh. He was replaced by the actor that we see, Saul Rubinek, and Rappaport's scenes were refilmed. Rappaport committed suicide two months later. Uh, but his original footage, Rappaport's footage, can be seen on disc five of the season three Blu-ray release under the episode venue. And uh, Rappaport is uh, the uh, the lead traveler in Time Bandits. You know, that whole group of travelers? He's he's the lead one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And uh, the last minute emergency casting of Saul Rubinek was largely a result of chance. Um, the director of this episode, Timothy Bond, had known Rubinek from school when in Los Angeles to work on the Bonfire of the Vanities. Uh, Rubinek asked Bond if he could visit the sets. Bond agreed and arranged a visit knowing that Rubinek was a Star Trek fan, an, a, an original series Star Trek fan. Um, in the process, uh, Bond persuaded Rubinek, who never did any TV guest roles at the time, to take the part of Kivas Bajo. So that's how we cool. got cool. Uh, Paul Razor from <laughs> Wish. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, do you know classic menage? Love a classic menage. Um, I hope that one creature is okay. The one creature that he shows is where he's like, beep, 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 it was only a puppet. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I just hope it's that okay. that that well, it's it's just a puppet because the lady you never saw that lady that got disintegrated at the end and that little creature on screen at the same time. So I think she would go behind the wall and like do the puppet thing and like make funny cute noises when Data would feed it. And so that's my that's my head cannon. So. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Well, Works for me. let's let's move on to probably the most emotionally heavy episode of this Sheesh. bunch. Um, <laughs> Sarek, legendary Federation ambassador Sarek visits the Enterprise to conclude peace talks with a race called the Lagarian Lagarans. His arrival is accompanied with a rash of unusual emotional outbursts among the crew. Um, friendly reminder: if you don't remember, Sarek is Spock's papa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he's Fox Father Sarek, the legendary Vulcan ambassador who is now 202 years old, now remarried to another Earth woman, Perrin, boards the Enterprise to crown his career before retiring by finalizing a painstakingly prepared for peace. Oh, say this five times fast. Painstakingly prepared peace negotiation with the Lagarans. Well um, done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sarek's <laughs> chief of staff, um, Chief of Staff, Kai Aloysius Mendrosen. Again, uh, reading job. is hard, you guys. Um, I've been thrown off by today's New York Times connections. And uh, his valet, Sakath. The Be- benefits of a peaceful alliance with the Lagarans are incalculable. So his chief of staff and personal assistant ask Picard that Sarek be given maximal rest in view of his weak health, which they obviously agree to. But Sarek insists on intending the ship's Mozart concert starring Data as violin soloist in his honor. And first of all, where's Chief O'Brien? Is, oh, you're telling quit. me there's multiple celloists on the Enterprise? He, he quit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't show it, but he secretly started dating his future wife, Keiko, and she hates cellos. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but I mean, also, again, a while never... there's two celloists aboard the Enterprise. Uh, but also, maybe not. There's a lot of people. So, um, Sarek insists on attending the Mozart concert and is so emotionally moved, he sheds a tear to which I audibly go, uh oh, because. Uh... <laughs> 
Vulcans, not supposed to do that. Sarek also displays unhappiness and anger that the conference room to the host of the Lagarans is not ready as they are sticklers for protocol. The room must be devoid of all furniture and the walls must be bare. The Lagarans themselves will sit in a pool of sticky liquid that has been specially installed in the conference room by Jordy and Wesley. Do you guys want to get in that pool? Because like they, they show people like... Look it looks at comfy. It. The way they were describing it, <laughs> it uh, maybe. Uh. <laughs> uh, Picard is a bit disappointed as he was looking forward to spending time with Sarek and understanding his thoughts and listening to his memories, appreciating the unique history Sarek had while uh, shaping the Federation. Real anthropologist stuff from Picard's point of view. But over the next several days, more and more crew members display unprovoked aggression, even towards friends and relatives. Jordy insults Wesley over the date he was going on and says he is a novice on women and dating. I was yelling at my TV, you guys. But, but Wesley had the best comeback. He at did. least I don't have to make girls in the, the holodeck. Boo, 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 boo. Or go to the holodeck to meet women or whatever. It was great. Yeah. I am yelling like... at my TV. You guys, stop. You guys. Beverly... I mean, that's that's why he got made a real ensign. Is that line? <laughs> Ricardo's that, like that, sick that's burn. The day he earned, that's the day he earned his pip. Yep. Sick uh, burn, Mister Crusher. <laughs> Beverly Have a and field Anna, promotion. <laughs> uh, theorize that Sarek is pot, is responsible for the outbreak of violence on the ship. They speculate that Sarek has the Ben Bendy Bendai syndrome. Bendai syndrome. Bendai, Bendai. thank you. Bendy um, syndrome's a different species. <laughs> Deanna sensed during the concert that Sarek had lost control of his emotions. These are symptoms of the Bendai syndrome. Vul Vulcans have telepathic abilities and Sarek might be unintentionally projecting these intense emotions onto other crew members on the ship at random. And the Lagarans might be impacted as well. So Picard speaks to his assistant, Mendrosen, who is outraged at the suggestion and suggests Picard find the real reason for the outbreaks before the Lagarans arrive. Data gets the valet, Sacketh, to confirm a medical theory that Sarek is affected by the rare Bendai syndrome, which causes old Vulcans to lose their most prized emotional self-control and telepathically spreads the epidemic. Sacketh says that so far he's been able to use his own telepathic abilities to protect others from Sarek's emotions, but now Sarek's emotional state has deteriorated to a point where even Sacketh cannot contain it. Picard must think of the negotiations with the, poss with the probably susceptible Lagarians, which cannot be delayed. Sarek, of course, denies his condition when Picard confronts him. Uh, Picard also tells Sarek about how Sakath has been helping Sarek in controlling his emotions. Sarek is alarmed and sends everyone away and speaks to Picard in private. He provides logical arguments for that there could be other causes for the unexplained phenomenon on the starship, and Picard reminds him that he cried at the concert. Did I <laughs> or did I not see you weeping at Mozart, Sarek? No, no. It wasn't me. It's another Vulcan. It wasn't me. <laughs> And of course, Sarek loses his temper at Picard and says that he's being illogical. And in this, Sarek sees his own condition and believes Picard. Once he admits it, a daring alternative is conceived. Perrin tells Picard that Sarek does a mind meld with him. So that while Sarek is at the conference, but it is Picard who is bombarded with the emotional onslaught from Sarek's mind. Picard has a horrible time, but the conference with the Lagarans is a success. Um... I this episode in particular, the feedback that I have heard from a lot of people that I've been talking with on Twitter about Star Trek in general had a really difficult time with this episode because of their own personal experiences with Alzheimer's and dementia yep. and their parents. Yep. Yeah. And uh yeah. Yeah. And we didn't, brutal. <laughs> we we were just starting to experience this spike in Alzheimer's in the late eighties, early nineties. Like as a kid I you always had like a, a grandparent or a great uncle who was a little whimsical, but like a real spike in it to the point mm -hmm. where like my very first job that wasn't my first part time or full time job was at a Alzheimer's care center when I was 18 and just being completely overwhelmed by the experiences these folks were having, especially when they had a lucid moment. And you're like, oh, my God. This is this is horrible. So Vulcan yes. Alzheimer's, right? See, at mm -hmm. the time of this viewing, I hadn't had that in my life. Yeah, uh, but but after rewatching currently, then it does. It hits harder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It. it uh, you're going. Oh yes. Oh. Mm. Mm. Uncle Boyd. Yes. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Dad. Oh, you know. <laughs> this is yeah. one of the first. Uh, I mean, we've been watching a bit, right? So. Uh, this is, I think, one of the the first times they really let 
Patrick Stewart go full sir. They just let say him that. go nuts. So yeah, and... they gave him some good dialogue some and great the next, stuff to work with. In and... the next episode too, yeah. but completely different things. But there's a yeah. line, there's a line where he's, no, it's wrong. A lifetime of discipline is washed away and in its place. Bedlam. I'm so old. There's nothing left but dry bones and dead friends. Oh. oh. Just Jeez. some brutal, really mm. brutal stuff here. Yeah. Wonderfully delivered by Sir Patrick Stewart. Um, the That scene in particular where he's just going ham with his acting abilities um, echoes a similar scene of Spock in The Naked Time down from, uh, from the original series down to a single take being used. Um, they did all of that in a single take, I think, a couple of times. Um, and Picard, and Patrick Stewart, just calling him Picard like it's his name, um, <laughs> crushed it. Absolutely crushed it. Oh, um, yeah. Just, just, call him script... his, just call him by his real name, Professor X. Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Bald man. Um, the script originally involved another ambassador, but the writers decided to use Sarek to bring home the idea that even the greatest of men is subject yes. to mental illness. Absolutely perfect. Excellent. Absolutely we, excellent choice. We wouldn't have cared as much. We would not yeah, have yeah. cared as much because he wasn't our uncle, you know. Well, and, and he's and, and it's Mark Leonard, right? Like the the guy's Star yeah. Trek royalty. He's played Vulcans. Mm -hmm. He's played Klingons. He's played just about everything. Romulans. And yeah. he's he's one of the few people out there that actually has the same vocal inflections as Vincent Price. So mm. it's like you you get caught up in listening to this guy because it's like his regionality is indeterminate. He. We've seen him play hammy, crappy sci-fi from the '60s. Yeah. We've seen him play great sci-fi from every ep. Is it's it's wild because, like you said, yeah, it's your it's your uncle because you know this guy. You've mm -hmm. you've especially if you're a Star Trek fan, you know yeah. this guy. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. He's uh, we yeah. know him. He's he, and then it, it wouldn't have had the emotional heft if it was a strange Vulcan. Right. It just wouldn't have yep. unless that actor was goddamn good. Uh, you know. But like it wouldn't have had the connection. It's better that we care, right? And it's exactly really interesting to me that for like you guys, as you, you know, are going through your rewatch, how now you know the perspective of time has added this other element yeah. for you. It's so kind of you to say time instead of old age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are welcome. Well, let's uh, move on to. Oh, hold, hold on just a second, because oh, yeah. I have a question. Have yes. you watched? How far are you through Lower Decks? Are I've you... watched all of Lower Decks. Because we see Bendai syndrome again, yes, um, with, with, the, with with the Beta Zeds. Tal Talin, no, mm -hmm. or no, or no. oh, Talin, Talin, the Vulcan you're right, you're right. cadet oh, or yes. ensign. Yes. So yes. we do see mm -hmm. it, and it's it's a uh, different. I mean, it's it's portrayed slightly differently, but it shows again for another generation of viewers, you know what what it's like. Wow. Yeah, I, uh, I've got those beta zoids on the mind because there was a group of um, cosplayers at WonderCon <laughs> dressed, <laughs> dressed up as yes, the drunk beta zoid women. Um, I'm upset. I'm obsessed. Um, but <laughs> speaking of beta zoids, Menage Troy. You know I love a little I'm, Oksana Troy episode. I'm so pissed. Why? I'm incensed. Hmm? Why? She was my least favorite character. And now you forever. love her? And now freaking lover i think she's <laughs> see i felt the same way until deep space nine and yeah. uh, yes i'll just say that episode where her and odo are stuck together different thing different yeah. thing yeah because that that did change things but i did not like her in next gen at all and it's like now i'm wondering if i'm gonna like alexander uh oh Mm. Well, 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 well. He's on his so, way. <laughs> when Deanna's mother spurns advances made by a Ferengi daemon, he takes it upon himself to kidnap the two of them, along with Commander Riker, and steal them away aboard this ship. This is a very interesting episode for me, personally, because I love Luoxana Troy, and I love anything to do with both Riker and Deanna, um, but you know how I currently feel about the Ferengi. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the first <laughs> actual Ferengi episode. They, because uh, they say human, and they start establishing their their fact mm -hmm. that they don't the like women to yeah. wear clothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and mm, just big irritation. <laughs> so the Enterprise has been on duty at a trade conference on Beta Z, which the Ferengi are attending for the first time, and Counselor Troy's mother, Luoxana, has been there as part of the Beta Z delegation. What is her job? Like, She's the holder of the sacred chalice. Yeah, and the Holy Rings oh. of Beta Z, you know. <laughs> the yep. doy. Uh, the t so the two spend some time together, and Loxana expresses her concern that Deanna has not yet married. 
classic mother-daughter stuff. Yeah. Uh, the Ferengi, represented by Damon Tog, also attended the conference, and they decide that having someone with Luxana's telepathic abilities would be of great assistance in their commercial dealings. Tog speaks to Luxana about her price for being his consort and his telepath. She, of course, insults him and humiliates him in front of everyone and makes him leave the Enterprise. The Ferengi minds cannot be read by Beta Zeds. That's a new twist. Why is why why is this? Do we know? Uh, they get caught in the ears. <laughs> the thoughts. They just go around and around and around. I'm just going it's with Ferengi, it's Ferengi plot armor. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going with the uh, with the the cranium, the, the lobes, know, the, the lobes. Because I mean the big the big heads because. You know, it it, sh it it blocks all minds. Isn't that probes. a Ferengi insult that we hear later? You don't have the lobes for that boy. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, yeah. It's actually their yeah. ears. Sorry, those are their ears when they're talking yeah, about their lobes. And yeah. See, and I'm talking right. about their skulls because they got great big skulls. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, also unrelated, Wesley has cleared the written exams for the entrance to Starfleet Academy, and only now has the oral exam to clear before he is admitted. Um, just keep that in mind for later. So the Ferengi <laughs> kidnap Luoxana along with Commander Riker and Deanna. Because um, they, Deanna and Riker had taken some shore leave to spend time with her mother on Beta Z and um, their outfits. I okay. absolutely loved their shore leave outfits. But <laughs> this gets back to I hate the relationship between Riker and Deanna because it's so goddamn confusing. You know? Because they're holding hands and getting ready to Mac. Exactly. They're in a situation yeah. ship. It's okay. It's a situation ship. You know, ship. they're getting ready to, to you know, they exp and and he'll, but he'll still run off and just anything. I, yeah. I got a hollow, I got a hollow deck program to nail. You know? I'll be back. And then, and then when she f falls for somebody, he's butt hurt. I just yeah. don't. This is one of the many reasons. Actually, I'm, I think, yeah, try I being. Think a, that's actually, yeah, this is just being a woman, Carrie. Like I don't know how to. But it's, a, how to but it's also an interesting role it's reversal. Just a woman experience. It's a fun. It's an interesting role reversal, also because he's the one who gets butt hurt, not her. When she he's off yeah. being Riker. Yeah, uh, uh, those two confuse me. Anyway, I'm, it's a situation ship. It, right. It's not for us okay. to. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're having a fun <laughs> picnic together right. uh, when. <laughs> Tog shows up with a bouquet of flowers, and I said out loud, Jesus Christ Almighty, because just <laughs> the Ferengi aggravate me so much, you guys. They're, they're but, really? but Rebecca, he had flowers. Come on, he doesn't that have the, he have the guitar nice player? Guy. Doesn't that make everything okay? Yeah, he's just a nice guy. <laughs> You want to hear my rendition of Wonderwall, Luxana? Okay. So, uh, so uh, uh. Deanna and Luxana are beamed aboard the Ferengi ship, abducted, uh, totally naked, because the Ferengi do not give women the respect of clothing, and they keep Deanna and Luxana naked, even though Luxana gets some coverings for them both. <gasps> Yeah, and somehow she turns that blanket into like a a, a sleigh queen gown, a fabulous yeah. Bob Mackie like thing, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, women are Look, capable saw, of anything. She that's saw Gone with the Wind. She saw what uh, Scarlet did with the curtains. She's like, got it. We're good. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> uh, that's a good John answer. Cena at the Oscars. Frank, <laughs> frankly, Damon, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I like your answer, Rob. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna puke. Tog wants to have sex <laughs> with Luoxana. And to buy them some time, Loxana has sex with him, even though it revolts her. And they they start kissing, right? And Deanna, I think Loxana did this on purpose, where she opened up her mind and let Deanna know what's going down in Ferengi Bone Town. And Deanna in her cell is like, I'm going to vomit. <laughs> My mother's performing umox on a Ferengi. <laughs> <laughs> Riker manages to trick the guards outside his holding cell. Oh, I forgot Riker was taken too, but he got to keep his clothes. Um, Riker tricks the guards outside his holding cell and beats them unconscious. Um, he does it in the most Riker way possible. One of them is trying to play three-dimensional chess. And Riker's oh, I, like... I thought he rammed a ship into him. <laughs> <laughs> Later. No, this is, this is <laughs> mentally challenging Riker, okay. right? Where he is like, oh, I can... Uh, yeah, you're, playing, you're playing the game all wrong. Um... So, uh, he gets to the communications panel, but he needs to get the access code from Tog. So, Riker tells Deanna, hey, can you get the access code? And Deanna's like, I'm on it. So, she telepathically to the Waxana, hey, I need this access code. Can you get it? And the Waxana, I it was so fascinated by this scene, too, because they're post-coital <laughs> cuddling and she's just rubbing on his earlobe 
Umox. <laughs> Umox. Because <laughs> it's an erogenous zone. <laughs> and she, um, because she cannot read his mind, she's like, hey, um, I'm going to make go make your favorite drink. Can I get your access code? <laughs> and he's like, yes, it's one zero zero. And then Deputy Farrick comes in. And he's like, stop it. <laughs> was that Neelix? That was. Blinded by okay. Yes, okay. yes, it was. Ethan okay. Phillips. Ethan Phillips. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's a regular on uh, Enterprise. Or oh. Pete from Benson. Yeah. So, well, he wants custody of Loxana to perform mind probes on her and understand how she gets her powers. And Farrick says that if Tog does not comply, he will report the access code incident, which could lead to Tog losing his command of his ship. You don't give out codes just because you're horny, Tog. So, meanwhile... Like her. <laughs> <laughs> Beta Z reports the disappearance of Riker, Loxana, and Deanna to the Enterprise, who uh, come to investigate. Data finds flowers in a pond that Tog had brought for Loxana and that she had tossed aside. The flowers are not native to Beta Z, and they came from a Ferengi world. They know that the Ferengi took hostages, but they don't know where to look. Riker, meanwhile, sets up an oscillation in the warp engine output. It will show up as a message in the subspace, subspace frequencies, but the Ferengi, uh, to the Ferengi, it will just sound like noise. Meanwhile, Wesley finally accepted into the oral exam section for Starfleet Academy, and he's worried that he may not be assigned to the Enterprise as his first assignment out of the Academy. 91% of graduates are not, ex are not assigned to a Galaxy-class starship on their first assignment outside of the Academy. It's also possible that Picard may not be the captain of the Enterprise by the time Wesley graduates. We'll keep it in mind for later. No. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Lame B-plot. Uh, the ship is waiting to transport him, but it won't delay any longer. Just as Wesley is about to beam out, he figures out the odd component in the static of subspace frequencies. He reports it to Picard and Data, who identified the location of where it's coming from. So Wesley, at the end of the day, saves the day. Yeah. Uh, Riker saves Luxana from Farrick while the Enterprise is on an intercept course. Luxana promises to stay willingly with Tog if he releases Deanna and Riker, the most selfless thing Luxana has ever done. Tog accepts and the Enterprise arrives on scene. Riker and Deanna are beamed back. Um, but if there's one thing about the Federation, never leave a man or Luxana behind. Mm -hmm. So in order to get her released, it will be necessary for Captain Picard to declare his everlasting love for her and threaten the Ferengi with bodily harm if she's not released. <laughs> Picard gives the performance of a lifetime to convince Tog that he desires Luxana more than him and she is let go by Tog. Um, this, is, this is the scene where Picard delivers Shakespeare's sonnets just off the dome. Mm -hmm. But he and, does it uh, horribly. So you have like one of the best Shakespearean <laughs> actors alive delivering terrible Shakespeare. And I was watching this, my kid was watching it and we were both dying. We're like, how was anybody on the set able to keep a straight face? Cause I know it would have broke me. Cause he was <laughs> acting. He was being <clears throat> French. Who just kind of knew some Shakespeare. And the Ferengi don't know. They don't understand. Yeah. The, and this is, the this is the, acting. this is the Picard meme. The birth yeah. of the meme. Birth yes. of the meme. Um, Wesley, of course, missed his oral exams, but cut to me sobbing because Picard promotes him to Ensign anyway. Because I know. he has performed so admirably that he doesn't really need to take the exam to prove that he's capable of being a Starfleet Ensign. And he gets a new uniform and he takes the help. And I'm on my couch <laughs> sobbing because I'm so proud of Wesley. <laughs> Who would have thought that two seasons ago? But, but, but think about <clears throat> think about what's happening on, say, another starship somewhere, another ship in the, you know, another galaxy class. How about that? And and the lower decks people are going, yeah. You hear about Crusher? Yeah. Yeah. His his mom is the chief <laughs> engineer. Nepo baby, this Nepo baby getting promoted yeah. without taking exams. And now he's you know engineering, and now he's promoted. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> 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 This they gotta be guy. they gotta be talking shit about Wesley on the other ships. They just gotta be, you know. Um this oh oh trivia trivia regarding Menage Troy. This episode is the origin of the snapshot of a card with a stressed out hand, blah blah blah. Um 
After his character's promotion on the show, Gene Roddenberry gave Will Wheaton the second lieutenant bars he earned in the Army Air Corps, second lieutenant wow. being equivalent to an ensign in the U.S. Navy. Oh. Present at the ceremony was General Colin Powell, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who later became Secretary of State. But isn't that so nice that, that Gene is. Roddenberry did a nice thing and gave Will Wheaton his second lieutenant bars? Law of averages oh. said it had to happen eventually. <laughs> For every and, terrible know, thing he says and does. Gosh, you're saying he's nice to the guy he named after his own middle name? Um, okay, George. It is, it is Eugene. It is Eugene Wesley Roddenberry. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, hmm. So hmm. we we say it was a proxy for the ch for the Kinder, and I say it's a proxy for old man Roddenberry. It could be. <laughs> um. This next episode, Transfigurations, the Enterprise finds a deserted planet where a ship has crashed and with it a lone survivor with no memory but extraordinary healing powers. Uh, not really going to talk much about this episode because I'm just yeah. so excited to get to Best of Both Worlds. Um, Jordy has a crush on a girl. Um, they find a they find an injured an injured traveler, which, by the way, the um, makeup and the and the makeup effects that they have done on this man can you even show that on tv because they, it was syndicated they can it, do a lot his mouth like you, it was like harvey dent in that nolan batman movie like <laughs> you could see his teeth through his cheek and... look up jonah hex not the movie <laughs> so about Josh about this Rowan. time about this time we had also syndicated like star trek was uh, we had some series that were really pushing the envelope on what you could pass for gore. And mm. because the, the stations that were playing it could decide when they were playing it here, we had Channel 13 playing um, War of the Worlds, the series, where they did full body melts that would get mm. twice as graphic as that Whoa. Um, at noon on a Saturday, you know? And it was just it was old, old times. Old and, times. like, I know, like, barely a season and a half ago, they showed that guy melting in the chair. Yeah. But uh, it's still, like, every, you know, maybe one episode a season, we're allowed to have, like, a really icky, icky moment. And good job to the makeup department here. <laughs> um, so this traveler, he's a John Doe. Nobody knows who he is. But he, we discover he has crazy healing powers. Um, he's also able to heal other people. Um, blah, blah, blah. Also, during all this time, Jordy, by ignoring the girl he likes, it makes her like him. So Jordy then realizes, oh, maybe if I just neg her, then she will endear herself to me. And um, soon they're kissing. And he feels more <laughs> confident in himself. And everybody's like, oh, Jordy, Jordy finally getting some. Um, literally, this John Doe guy. Uh, they find out where he's come from, where his point of origin, and they're like, okay, we're going to send you back. And he's like, oh, no, thank you. Um, I do not want to. And they're like, why? And he's like, I don't know. I just know I don't want to. And uh, <laughs> uh, he, as they are heading back to that point of origin, he's like, okay, I'm just going to. I'm just going to go because I have a feeling I shouldn't be here. So he tries to escape by stealing a shuttle. Worf stops him. Um, Worf breaks his neck. And I am... I know he's fine. I know it's all fine. <laughs> I'm still scared. And luckily, <laughs> this man with the healing powers fixes him, so I don't have to worry anymore. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Back on his home planet, they demand the extradition of this escaped criminal. And um, they're like, okay, why is he a criminal? Because that's Starfleet Federation protocol. Okay, explain yourself. Why is this man a, a criminal? And they're like, he just is. So give him back. <laughs> trust <please>. us. Yeah, <laughs> just we're, trust we're us. We're cops. Trust us. All right. And so he is. Uh, the John Doe is willing to surrender, but maintains that he feels he needs to complete something. And Beverly is, of course, Beverly also horny for this guy. Haven't even mentioned it, but Beverly is horny for any kind of medical mystery. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Picard talks to the, the man demanding extradition and says that, hey, this guy has powers to heal others and he can heal death itself. Um, the the people of this planet, is he's outraged and he launches a beam of the Enterprise. Like chokes fake, the news. Mm -hmm. fake, fake news. Fake news. Uh, it chokes the entire crew, the entire crew except John, and John heals the entire ship with his touch. And now John remembers who he is. He reveals 
to Picard that he is a mutant from his planet who is <laughs> on the boundary between the physical and the metaphysical. And the society rejected him and others like him and branded them criminals. Four of them escaped. Three were hunted down and killed. And John survived with the help of the Enterprise. John then transfigures into a yellow morph suit full of energy and tells uh his home planet people um hey you can do this too um they leave and john converts into a beam of energy and leaves and beverly is once again just left horny for the horny, mystery i guess wah, yeah wah. sad she trombone got, she got <laughs> the medical mystery blue balls yep. yes <laughs> yeah uh my favorite thing about this episode um the mood lighting especially in med bay uh, was insane. Like, can we get these lights at Ikea? I'm just <laughs> um, I thought it was amazing that when John Doe finally made his metamorphosis into his final form, he had still had the morph suit crease on top of his... Yeah. Mm, like, because his head was a little smaller than the morph suit, so there's like this <sighs> double fold of fabric. And he's glowing, so like, they took the time to do a special so effect. This, so this is an interesting special effect. Let me tell you about it. The scene when John was transformed was done live with only minor post-production touch-up. Um, the actor wore a suit that glowed. This is a similar effect used for jor L in Superman from 1978, where the oh, actor yeah. wore a suit made of reflecti retro-reflective tape covered in tiny glass beads, much like the reflective tape used on ambulances. This causes light to be reflected back parallel to incident light rather than randomly scattered. The reflective light therefore appears far brighter than all other elements in the scene to the degree that the suit causes a light blowout in which all surface detail is lost ah. so i'm sure if we were to watch this on an old rca this would look mind-blowing mm -hmm. but because yeah. we're watching it on, on, on an hd 4k tv we can see some morph suit details um yeah. it's just a proto clean guy that's all it is <laughs> yeah um Let's see. Dr. Crusher is assisted by Nurse Temple, named as a tribute to Nurse Chapel from the original series. Oh. Um, and in what will become a character trademark on both Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, Miles O'Brien reports to sick bay after injuring his shoulder in a holodeck <laughs> kayak simulation. Yes. Yep. It's not his first accident because Wesley asks, kayaking again? <laughs> yep. That's that, that, that was the one thing that I remembered from this episode. <laughs> I just went, uh, kayaking, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I didn't care I, about the whole episode. I just didn't care, but it was the kayaking most, thing that did it. One of my most favorite joke formats um, is the inclusion of not again. That's, uh, I love it when a joke ends with not again to imply it's happened before. Um, all right. So uh, to the most exciting episode that we're going to talk about this week, the best of both worlds, part one. Responding to a distress call in one of the Federation's outermost colonies, the Enterprise arrives, only to find a big hole in the ground where the town used to be, and discovers the Borg are behind the attack. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Oh, I, hey. I have to, I have to make an apology to Star Trek. You, yeah, yeah, because right, I was. Hang I, on, I, let, let me get Star Trek on the phone. And yeah, then, get him on the phone. <laughs> we'll do Star Trek. Star, Star Trek. Star Trek. I'm sorry. There you go. S Star Trek, I'm very sorry that the last Borg episode that came along, I was upset and I said that they had retconned the Borg unfairly because I said that they were only interested in technology and lo and behold, in this episode, they actually bring that up. So I'm sorry, okay. Star Trek, there I have you wronged go. you. There you go. Well, well, well. So I the Enterprise um, is responding to a distress signal from an outermost Federation outpost. The location of the outpost has just has an enormous hole in the ground and nothing else, and 900 people are just gone. And can we talk about, I only assume this is a matte painting that we it are was. looking yeah. at, because it's, I, I had to stop freeze frame it, screenshot, use it as a, as a computer wallpaper, because it's gorgeous. <laughs> That's a good one. Just, the tiny, tiny Riker, tiny, tiny data. I can't remember who else is there. And then just this huge landscape with a hole in the ground. Just, it's stunning. Kudos to the people who made that. Um, Admiral Hansen and Commander Shelby personally boarded the Enterprise to join the investigation of a destroyed Federation colonized planet suspecting the feared Borg. Shelby is leading the Federation defense strategy against the Borg. All weapons are still at drawing board stage. So... We know the Borg are a threat. We're working on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Hassan points out to Picard that Commander William T. Riker has, for the third time, refused a command, preferring the Enterprise. 
Hansen uh, wanted Shelby to be Picard's new first officer. Hansen wants Picard to force Riker to take command chair at the Melbourne, which is currently on offer. Shelby announces her intentions to Riker that she plans to replace him once she, he accepts his offered commission at the Melbourne, and Riker is still undecided. Interesting character development here for Mr. William T. Riker. Mm-hmm. As a... Um, Man, you could be a captain. They've asked you to be a captain now three times. Why won't you? Have do you it? seen what I got going on here? <laughs> Have you seen this? Rich Corinthian leather. <laughs> well, I, I think I, later I, on. I think later on in the episode, he's really relieved he didn't take command of Melbourne. <laughs> but uh, it's also this. It's also established too that this Shelby character isn't she aggravating? A woman with a strong personality and gung ho attitude. Oh, gross. I did not find her irritating at all. I didn't <laughs> either. She was but awesome. Riker, I Riker loved her. even said, like, they, they point out, like, man, she sure is irritating, isn't she? And Riker's even like, yeah, kind of, or I can't remember who says it, but they're like, yeah, kind of like you were when you first I think it was started. Deanna. It was Deanna. 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 Yeah, she's like, yeah, like, doesn't it remind you of somebody? And how Memba? you've gotten <laughs> soft, you've gotten soft in this first officer's position, Riker. Well, so, no, I think that he actually called himself out for being getting himself like, am I losing my touch? Because mm-hmm. I remember, because then he's like, yeah, I remember being you know, that kind of firebrand after she calls him on it. He's like, man, maybe it is me. And it is really nice that he um, he takes the time to do some self-reflection and actually like he does call himself out right on some of these like, well, huh, I don't know. Um, we also forgot to mention that since Wesley has been promoted to Ensign, he gets to play poker with everybody. Oh, yes. Fun? <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> So Shelby analyzes the magnetic resonance traces on the Enterprise from where the Borg had hit and finds the same traces of the remnants at the outpost. There is no, it's, without a doubt, this is a Borg attack. Hansen returns to Starfleet Command to discuss strategy, but Shelby remains at the Enterprise. Picard asks Riker to reconsider his decision to remain on the Enterprise. Shelby figures out that a Borg ship has redundant power sources and generators that allows them to function even if the ship is damaged partially. Um, Shelby works on figuring out how to configure current weapons to best fight the Borg. So the Enterprise then, this is where it gets so scary, you guys. The Enterprise gets reports from Hansen about a possible Borg attack at a position one hour away from them. And the Enterprise is like, okay, we are going. But then Hansen is like, the nearest backup ship is six days away. And the Enterprise is still like, we're going to go. And me at home on my couch, I'm like, you guys are fucked. <laughs> oh, there's no way. And, and I would have, as first officer said, could we wait six days? Can we? But there's, they, they can't. There's a possible uh, people are people's lives are at risk. Uh, I got, we, I got Foo Fighters tickets on Beta Z. Come on, gotta go. <laughs> are Foo we Fighters not the Foo program. Fighters ourselves, though? Yeah, we are the fighters of Foo. Uh, so shortly after, um, so they they the Enterprise heads that way, and I'm like, can you guys not please? And um. <laughs> Uh, an enormous Borg ship is found, a giant space cube adrift in the mo- in the ever blackness, and it engages in battle with the Enterprise. And I, on my couch, again, you guys are so fucked. <laughs> <sighs> the Borg demands that Picard boards their ship, and Picard, of course, refuses and wants the Borg to leave Federation space. He's going to try negotiating nicely first. Uh, <laughs> the Enterprise then draws the Borg away because the whole the their whole thing is we got to at least protect everybody else, right? So mm-hmm. let's get the Borg as far away from everybody else as possible, and then we can try our best to fight this big cube. So uh, the Enterprise draws the Borg away. The Enterprise tries the new phaser and shield frequencies, but the Borg have been able to qu- uh, quickly learn and adapt. Uh, the new modifications on the Enterprise fail to stop the Borg. The Enterprise is in the grip of a Borg tractor beam. Shelby works with Data to scramble the phaser frequencies faster than the Borg can adapt to them. Data manages to destroy the Borg tractor beam, and Enterprise manages to run away. Whew, okay, point one for the Enterprise. Shelby suggests to Riker to separate the saucer section and to also use the deflector shield as an offensive weapon against the Borg. Riker disagrees and says the saucer section's impulse engines would be required in battle. Shelby accuses Riker of being in her way and she and he sits comfortably in the shadow of a great man. Shots fired at you directly, Mr. Riker. (laughs) (laughs) He sits in the shadow of a great man without having to make any big decisions, which is exactly why I would never, ever, ever want to graduate from a first officer position, because I get it. (laughs) Picard hides the ship in a nebula, and the Borg wait patiently outside. Again, 
had to screenshot this and make it a computer computer wallpaper because they're hiding in this beautiful pink and purple nebula. Milk, um, lights, and salt water. Yep. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Absolutely oh, it is. Beautiful. Uh, the Borg forced the Enterprise out of the nebula by adapting again and firing on the nebula itself. The Enterprise tries to run away, but Picard is kidnapped by the Borg beaming, beaming directly onto his bridge. Uh, the Borg changed course towards Earth. They're like, fine, we will just stop this at the source and start heading to Earth. Picard finds that they tolerate no resistance. They say the thing. Resistance is futile and intend to turn him into a Borg. They want all humanity to serve the Borg. Shelby, Worf, Beverly, and Data are on the away team to find Picard on the Borg ship. Big, um, big scare. Big scare. And I love this, too, because Riker's like, okay, I'm away. I always lead the away team. We're off to go find Picard. And Shelby has to say, sit down, you old man. You (laughs) are the captain of the ship now. I know if you don't want to be captain, captain will come to you. And now this grand purpose has found itself thrust upon your lap and you must take it, Riker. But again, she, she, she says, are you sure to him? Mm -hmm. It's Deanna who's like, um, you're the top kick. You can't go. You can't yeah. go. Remember, so once how, again, it's Deanna going, no, you can't. Remember how Picard wants to go on missions and you tell him no? You're the Picard now. You can't mm-hmm. go. You have to stay here and be in charge. So Riker <laughs> finds himself as acting captain, a responsibility he did not want, but finds it thrust <laughs> upon him anyway. Uh, and he wants um, Hanson, who tells him that the Federation will make their stand well before the Borg reach Earth. Riker wants them to oh, concentrate three, five, defensive nine. around Earth. <laughs> so Riker, hey Earth, heads up, Borgs are coming. Put up them them wooden them wooden spears. <laughs> <laughs> the, the away Cir- team <laughs> circle the wagons. Circle the Borgs the are wagons. coming. The Borgs are circle coming. The space wagons. The away team manages to damage the Borg ship by destroying it, the distributors that allow it to function as a collective. The Borg drop out of warp. Can you imagine that big Borg spaceship traveling at warp? Insane. Um, the Enterprise readies the deflector weapon. The away team sees Picard as a Borg and our beams back. <sighs> they got him. They got him, you guys. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Oh, what are we going to do? Uh, Riker fires the deflector shield weapon, but it does not have any impact. Uh, episode ends. And to everybody, listen. Okay, so big cliffhanger for season three. Um, mm-hmm. oh, I can't imagine what you guys must have gone through. Oh, you need to wait three oh, months. Yeah. Yes. I I was alive in 2023 when Strange New Worlds season two finale happened and there was a writer's strike happening. And now yeah. I, I still to this day, however many months ago was that? Like 18? Who knows by now? True. I don't know when I'm getting Strange New Worlds, you guys. You mm-hmm. guys went through a baby wait time. I have earned my scars. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we didn't have writers in the eighties and nineties. <laughs> they couldn't. They couldn't strike. Um, we, uh, yeah, it was. It was. A, it was a long wait, as I recall, wasn't it, Lee? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, it was. It was what? Four months, maybe four, four and a half months. Four and a half months. This would, this would be like in May yeah. or June, and, and then yeah, the new season some... was September or October. It was. Yeah. It was ages. Yeah. I remember screaming. When Picard came on the screen <laughs> and called him number one as Locutus, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, it was. Uh, it was too much. My brain exploded. I knew it was I coming. Died. I knew. I knew the cliffhanger was coming. Um, <clears throat> and yet, <laughs> and yet, here I sit. Yeah, baffled. Um, one of the most effective cliffhangers Star Trek period ever pulled yeah, off. Probably, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> if I was Riker, I would be puking everywhere. Like I would just be." <laughs> There's, there, there's <laughs> with the fear there, of responsibility. There is a cliffhanger in San Francisco and a in a, a mystery head they find mm. underneath mm. San Francisco that I think was a very effective cliffhanger too, but not like this. No. Mm. Not hey, like this. This is the this. first one you're just like, what the what? And you don't know what's mm-hmm. gonna happen, and everything is just in so much state of flux, you're just like, uh and it's the first season of the show where where the writers have been given enough leg room to explore the characters well enough that you yes. really were giving a shit about them right like yes yeah this is this is your star trek now it's not mm-hmm. it's not just a fluke 
And I, then uh, we and then we had to rush out and get our Locutus a Borg action figure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man with the most toys. Um, when oh. Strange New World season two ended, um, everyone everyone was like, "Oh, so now you know how we felt when Tri Next Generation season three ended." Blah 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 blah. You do not know pain as I as I have known pain. <laughs> okay, let's. <laughs> Let's talk about some trivia for this episode. Uh, Michael Miller was initially hired as a freelance screenwriter for only one year, with his last script being The Best of Both Worlds Part 1. I cannot believe I've made it this far without making a Miley Cyrus Hannah Montana reference. The best of both worlds. Look it up oh. in the song. You see, um, I would have gone Van Halen, but that's uh, me. Uh, 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 <laughs> this episode... Uh, 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 trivia ends with a major cliffhanger leaving him knowing that he'd not be responsible for resolving it in the best of both worlds part two however this episode alone garnered huge ratings and in general helped push the series from its lower ratings ranking to become the highest syndicated series during this time yep. as a result gene roddenberry was so satisfied with pillar's work during the third year of the series that he personally asked pillar to stay on this required pillar to write a resolution the episode which kicked off the series next season Oh, so he set the bar so freaking high thinking he wouldn't have to write the thing. <laughs> Can you imagine being that dick who's like, top of this, you assholes? Yeah, <laughs> mic drop. Wait, 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 I got to pick it back up? What? Oh, damn it. Crap. <laughs> this episode, along with Best of Both Worlds, Both Worlds Part 2, um, were listed on TV Guide's 100 Greatest Episodes, um, ranking in at number 36. Oh, uh, that's really good. It's pretty good. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. Again, so this this episode also, I know I've mentioned it before when I know that an episode is like rated amongst one of the highest Star Trek shows of all time. It had the show starts with that feeling. Like there's always mm -hmm. there's always a feeling that comes there's some with energy just to the it. beginning. Just the, you're right, an energy where you're like, oh, this is gonna be a good one. You know, I finally got to realize what it was that was bugging me about Riker's uniform all season. It was missing a pip. Yeah, man's gotta be man's gotta be a captain. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's great. I like we said earlier, Picard's lost forever, and uh, Riker's the captain of the Enterprise from this point forward. Um, it's pretty awesome. It's uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 seminal Star Trek. It's one of those that you whip out to show people who aren't familiar with Star Trek. You know, you you pull that one out of your DVD collection and go, see, see. It's pretty good. It's so pretty good, so that huh? raises that raises the question of so we tried to not hype this up too terribly much, but couldn't yeah. help it because we knew it was coming. So you had to put up with us for, you know, two and a half seasons <laughs> of but episode, you know, last episode mm. of season three. So did it live up to the hype that we tried not to overhype? Right. Well, yeah. Uh yes. And what's so funny is like because you guys you guys are so fantastic at being like so cool about avoiding spoilers and like not trying to hype things up too much everybody else who's a star trek fan that i interact with um does that though like they they are like oh man season three season three finale you were in for a ride of a time <laughs> so i can't totally avoid like knowing which episodes are good ones versus bad ones um and I try, I, knowing that this episode was going to be like such a doozy, I try very hard to go into it very nonchalant, like, <laughs> see if I care about this episode at all. I don't. Everybody can't get says me to it's care. good, so I can't don't get know. me to care at all. But then there's the energy, and mm -hmm. just the episode progresses, and Riker is getting more and more frustrated with Shelby, and the Borg are coming, and I'm just like, there's no way, there's no way. What? Are they doing this? There's absolutely <laughs> no way. Um, it's I cannot help but get like hyped up because just the show does that itself, and it does a very good job of being Star Trek, you know. <laughs> and, and Pillar went on to redefine Star Trek. Yeah, it's there's there's a book written about it, the Pillar Effect, and it's uh it's all about how Michael Pillar and he's he he died in his fifties, like he died relatively young. And oh dang. He uh, managed to, I, I think the magic was wearing off by the time some of the later series came on, but I think that had more to do with Brandon Braga and a couple other people that had been hired on. But uh, Pillar, Ronald D. Moore in particular, I think uh, seeing especially what Moore's doing right now, if Michael Pil or if, if Pillar had stayed alive. Um, oh, yeah. You the, just the imagine. Things, the things we'd be seeing in, in speculative fiction right now would probably be pretty earth shattering. Yeah. Again, that's just going off of what Ronald Moore's done since DS9. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One last piece of trivia. 
On the day when the teaser scene was filmed, the production staff gathered for a group photograph of everyone involved, both on camera and behind camera, uh, in the making of the series. This was the last crew slash staff photograph to feature Gene Roddenberry prior to his death shortly thereafter. Oh. So, just uh, wild, wild. I don't, uh, I tell you what, I'm so excited. I can, I can finally watch the next episode because I have been <laughs> intentionally waiting to watch the next part after I we talked about it. <laughs> I have a recommendation for you. Yeah, what is it? Star Trek? Watch, yeah, yeah. Watch <laughs> watch part two and then yeah. immediately watch the episode afterwards. That's the other Ooh. thing everybody's telling me is that this is not real. This is more of a three-parter and not like yeah. not really a two-parter. There's a very mellow third episode to this story arc, but it's also mm. gut-wrenching. And oh, we, we had a hard time with spoilers not only because of things that we want to talk about and things that that are like part of our dna like the three of us this is just baked in dna for the last pretty much your entire lifetime but also we know you saw the last episode of picard yeah we watched it with you yeah <laughs> like, i was there <laughs> that entire episode's a million spoilers wide right it's yeah. like how much does she remember how much how i much? here's the fun thing about my brand of adhd um yeah I'm not gonna remember any of it. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny because, like, if I'm, Lee, if I'm, gonna, yeah, go for it. I'm gonna say I'm gonna count it. There's a fourth episode to this arc as well, but it's in a different series. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. and there, well, it's a pretty important. Yeah. Theory. What is yeah. it? What, what is it? The first episode you, of you, DS9. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Stop telling me to watch DS9. I know. No. Hey, at the rate we're at the rate we're going, we're 15 weeks away from DS9. Uh, I worry that we we are gonna have that same effect on Deep Space Nine. No, you know, that we're gonna no. overhype it, and she's no. gonna get there and go. Ah, oh, but listen, I've been... you guys are not the only ones hyping up DS9. Everybody and it was... else in existence has been and hyping up the, DS9. It was the underdog while it was on. Yeah. It was the show that was getting trashed left and right yeah, by people who... The fans and, hated it for some reason. And they, they dared to sell a sequential story. I was reading, I, I haven't had a chance because I really want restored DS9 and it's never going to happen because no. they said it would bankrupt It would bankrupt a lot of nations just to make a remaster of DS9. They can't even make a fourth Star Trek movie. What makes you think they're going to yeah. restore yeah. DS9? No, it's, it's just the way it was shot. Like It was one of the first sci-fi series shot digitally. Uh, for the special effect sequences and to up res them without those artifacts they don't exist anymore they don't have the models there's huh. there's a mm. lot of things they can't do with them so uh, did you but, know um we're also not going to ever get ed on dvd because the music rights cost too much yeah oh, it's probably the uh wkrp in cincinnati syndrome yeah. Oh, they, I can list. I can list the shows. There, uh, yeah. there are dozens of them that are that. Give me Ed on DVD, you cowards. W, w, WKRP not only lost the rights to all the music they played in the first run, when they remastered it again for VHS, they didn't think any other formats were coming out, so they lost the rights the second time around. <laughs> I so, wish I could. I wish I could live in a time when I thought VHS was the end all be all. What the, four, the 480 the 480 DPI was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll, uh, it'll never get better than this. <laughs> this is the best. With tape, physical tape. Yes, this look is at the that. End of the line, you no, guys. You you watched you watched uh what do they call it in Doctor Who? Uh the fixed point in time. The, yep. Those things that can't yeah. be touched ever again. Yeah. Best of both worlds is one of those fixed point in times where you're just like, this echoes through everything. Like, everything that happens in this has repercussions in, in Voyager, DS9, Enterprise somehow, mm -hmm. uh, movies, the other series. It's like these ripples just go on and on and on. And it's just this one episode changes we also, everything we also didn't talk about why the borg were so specifically invested in picard because they needed what was it they needed a human voice a speaker a human speaker, a speaker. and what does locutus them. mean rob speaker exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay well oh, oof, rob corrected now. me on that because i got my my latin it doesn't exist and i think rob's latin does so uh <laughs> and, and, and he um, said yes locutus means speaker Next next week, um, we're gonna tell, we're gonna we're gonna follow up this doozy of a finale. Uh, we're gonna launch right into season two with the best of both worlds part two: family, brothers, suddenly human, and remember me. Um, 
what do, what do you guys think? Best best episodes ever, or mm-hmm. one of a couple one of them of, are are really quite good. I think, yeah. I think you've got a season four coming up. That's uh, it's a, I don't want to call it a musical episode, but it involves an instrument that oh. is a fantastic episode. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Ooh, baby, you know I love a musical episode. But I, I think the best season's actually season five, hmm. like episode per episode by episode, because uh, if I'm not wrong, Darmok is in season five. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Good that's point. A, that's a good yeah. one. That's yeah. a good one. Stop so. hyping it up, Lee. Oh, can't help it. <laughs> you'll, you'll see. The walls <laughs> fell. All right, you guys. Well, um, until then, we thank you again for joining us. Um, thank, and just thank you guys for listening and being so cool. The Star Trek fandom has been the coolest fandom I have ever encountered. Like, thank you That's for being one. awesome. Um, especially after yesterday, uh, we're recording this on April 1st. April Fool's, everybody. Um, and yesterday was Trans Day, uh, Trans Day Availability. And um, it's so fun to watch fake Star Trek fans try to be like, not in my Star Trek and all of the other Star Trek fans are like, you are wrong. Yeah. And you obviously don't like the show. Um, yeah. Anyway, oh, hey. So thank you, Star you Trek want, fans, for being so cool. You want to, you want to know Roddenberry's oh. feelings on gay people? Go read his novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Is it because good? Yeah. I read I read that to you, Rebecca. Your ADHD oh. does not allow you to remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, where yeah. Where, <laughs> where, uh, where Kirk is reflecting on whether or not he would have taken Spock as a lover because a lot of people had speculated that. Mm-hmm. So, you yeah, boy. Yeah. Um, oh, also, I talked about this on Geek Show proper, but the documentary, William Shatner's documentary, You Can Call Me Bill, just go ahead and skip it. Not worth your time. Unless it's for free somewhere, then you can just kind of put it on the background and get super high and then be like, what is this man saying? Um, anyway. I'll wait for it to land on one of my streaming services, whatever it is. It's not so. It's not so. He talks about horses so much. So he loves horses. Uh, I, I believe it's going to be on the uh, Amazon offshoot channel, Horse Fancy. Horse Fancy. <laughs> Horse bee. My pool. Okay, guys. I can't keep my pool clean. Uh, Something keeps my wife clogging. Is in there. My dead wife is in there. Something <laughs> keeps clogging the drain in my pool. Mm, he talks about. How he was, he has property in the mountains and he was naked and there was a lizard. And he was like, I saw how this lizard gets water off a leaf and I thought, I can't sell this place. Apropos, what what are you talking about, Bill? Okay, anyway, that's all. I'll, I'm gonna, I'll, let, gonna you, I'll let you know in, I'll let you know in 40 years when I'm his age <laughs> and I can relate. <laughs> Rebecca, I was on my property and I saw this lizard eating a watermelon and I thought, I can't sell this property. Where did that little watermelon come from i know i've said it before but i just think it's hilarious that both bezos and shatner went to space bezos came back and said haha yeehaw motherfuckers and shatner was like i i don't know what is life and have like a whole existential <laughs> crisis it's just so yeah. funny to me yeah why does god need a spaceship all right all right guys well thank you so much for tuning in this week and until next week we will continue to go uh, where no man has gone before, but a lot of men have gone before. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>